Hello Year 10, this is the third lesson now, uh, same shirt, sorry, the third lesson of three on chapter four, how did the Second World War change living in Germany under the Nazis, or living in Nazi Germany, uh, for people in Germany. So, last lesson, we went through the Second World War in general, I gave you some notes, we finished off with an image task, which you should have done before beginning this part of the course. So if you haven't done it already, stop the video right now because frankly it won't be helpful and you need this just to wrap things up and you need that uh, storyboard in front of you to make sense of things. Not because I'm giving you the answers, I'm not, it's your storyboard, uh, but because otherwise this will just get in the way and you'll devise part of your storyboard to include it and no one wants that. Hopefully then, those of you that remain are those people that have actually done the storyboard. I say that, I know that you, Max, probably haven't. I know that you, Nathan, definitely haven't, no matter what you say. Um, unless you can show me it, then, then I'll be impressed. Um, the rest of you, however, I'm going to assume have had a go, even if it's just stick figures and badly drawn hammer and sickles. That is perfectly fine. Um, obviously, you might have used spasticas. Please don't cover it entirely in spasticas. That wouldn't be appropriate. Maybe go and rub some of those out. Anyway, onwards. Today's part of the or this, I say today's, it's the same day as the last one. Uh, this part of the course, this third section of chapter four, comes back to the overall question we're asking at the beginning. How did the Second World War affect Germany under the Nazis? And if you remember, there were three things I was aiming to achieve. I said that all of you will be able to explain at least two ways in which Second World War affected life in Germany under the Nazis for ordinary people. By this point, I would usually ask you, and I'd usually get a response, we'd end up with about six. As it is, I can't ask you. So I've got to assume that you've got things like cinemas, uh, sacrifices of fur coats, evacuees, uh, lack of postal service, lack of cinemas, increasing militarism, booty, um, perfume, and yeah, that'll do. Um, military pride, if you wish. Most of you, I said, will be able to link events in the Second World War to key aspects of life in Nazi Germany, such as persecution of the Jews, careful with that one, we haven't done it yet, uh, women, that should be obvious, they're torn between roles, opposition, it increases in the second half, workers, they work harder for less food and significantly less pay and benefits, remember the, uh, the payments, uh, the expenditure on uh, military and civil projects, and the youth, they start out disliking it, they dislike it more towards the end. I think I said that at the beginning. Some of you will be able to consider the Second World War as a potential saviour of the Third Reich, and you'll have used that charge of expenditure to begin to understand it. I'm not going to explain this one. It's well in advance of what you need for GCSE. If you've got a handle on it, ace. If you don't, it's irrelevant. Don't worry, what's irrelevant? It's a great thing with a trunk. Yes, that joke came back. Um, and I'm going to talk about Germany in the final months of the war. So let's look at these. I've got four, uh, sorry, three areas to look at. How did the Nazi state deal with the fact they were inevitably going to lose? Now, I said before that history doesn't really have inevitables. It kind of does in the Second World War. So let's look at this. In terms of propaganda, this reality reversing way of trying to explain to people what's going on, you end up with these ridiculous posters. There's this one, for freedom and life, the Volkssturm, the old man who's too old to join the army, the young man who's too young to join the army, fighting in the last moments. The Volkssturm were run by Goebbels, and they were fanatical volunteers who were fighting because they believed the alternative was death. Not at the hands of the Nazis, but at the hands of the Soviets. And in the Battle of Berlin, they regularly piled in. So worse, so badly did it go that the Nazi generals phoned in and said, please, can you stop them throwing themselves into our carefully laid ambushes? We're killing our own people. To which Goebbels responded, if the German people wish to sacrifice themselves, that is no business of yours. And then put the phone down. Um, brilliant, well done. Uh, you are the front, we talked about that before, uh, this idea that the workers were somehow keeping the army going. Well, obviously they were, um, but as if that was gonna make a difference in the end. Then you've got, uh, also you, join the SS. That boy is probably around about 14. Here we have the kind of racist, as I say kind of racist, the racist way of the, the bitter way of doing it. That of course 
is what remains of the Reichstag building. And here we have US forces being depicted as black soldiers saying them Europeans sure have funny looking factories because apparently black people don't get culture because racism. And then you've got an extract from a pamphlet created by Josef Goebbels on the 22nd of April, three days before Hitler shoots himself. He says this, in 1918, we gave up at the last minute. That will not happen in 1945. We all have to see to that. This is the foundation of our ultimate victory. It may sound improbable today, but it is nonetheless so. Final victory will be ours. I can't help thinking he's right. Just not in the way that he would have intended. Because, you know, Nazis exist. People are anti-Semitic all the time. And nothing changes. Some people are in power and they do that. So there's propaganda. There's the truly jaw-dropping lying, for want of a better phrase. The second thing is spite. It's just pure spite. Doing things um, purely because they're going to hurt someone, not because you think they're going to make any kind of difference. The vengeance weapons, the V1 Doodlebug, which is a jet engine, kind of, it's a pulse engine, strapped to an aircraft fuselage filled with the uh, um, explosives and flown roughly at London. Um, it's sort of directed by a gyroscope. When it runs out of fuel, it dive bombs and explodes. V1 bombers, they're insane. They're, they're, they're drone aircraft that just explode randomly in London. London's sprawling enough and big enough that it's relatively easy to hit. Were any of these militarily viable? Of course not. They were fired from uh, treks in France, northern France, um, and one of the key aspects of the early part of the invasion was to try and knock them out. Uh, later on, they developed the V2 rocket and they fired them from Holland. And well, you can see for yourself, it's a missile basically uh, that shoots up into the air and then lands a little bit more accurately uh, somewhere in London. These are spite weapons, no more, no less. The amount of stuff that the Nazis throw at this, by the way, uh, could have kept them going with jet aircraft for ages. It could have trained up pilots, but instead they insist on this. It's spiteful, it's wasteful, it's solely there to try and lay waste. It's, it's, there's no military aspect to this. There's no um, aim in mind apart from world ending destruction. Uh, Adolf Hitler famously said, if the German people have uh, led themselves to this point, then they deserve oblivion. And of course, death. Um, the, the persecution of the Jews. I said we'd link it. I still haven't done the persecution of the Jews, but this is where it ends. These are the ovens that were still running when the Soviets came in to uh, Birkenau, part of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they dynamite the rest of them. These ones are still running. Uh, these are the piles of ash outside, and these are the ovens where they liberated the bits of human to prove that they were doing it. People who deny that this ever took place, well, I don't understand them. Photographs like this exist. Uh, also, using the maths of Holocaust deniers, because I'm bored and I do this kind of thing, uh, I did work out that one camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, should have been able, by their maths, to deal with around, I say deal with, to murder and burn around about 6.8 million people. Well, guess what? That's roughly how many people are killed in all of the death, camp, death camps put together. So I guess they weren't terribly efficient then. This uh, is bundles of human hair. It's that bit that gets me. It's, uh, it's a braid. It's a short braid. It's a child's braid. Somebody braided that hair. They didn't do it themselves. Before it was shaved off to be used as insulation, U-boat, or a fan belt and tank. This is one of the uh, warehouses. Uh, these are shoes. Uh, there's other stuff in the background. Taken from the Jews, sent back home for use. This stuff never made it back to Germany. And this is a photograph that was taken by a Soviet journalist who couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. But the soldiers that marched in, the Soviet soldiers that marched into Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, the commandant surrendered the camp and the journalist heard shooting. Anxious to film and take pictures of a last minute firefight, he crested a ridge and saw this. Two SS guards going through a series of prisoners, making sure they were dead. 
How did the Nazi state deal with the inevitable defeat? Well, they went full apocalyptic and decided to take it to the last. Albert Speer was ordered to ensure that, oh, hang on, to ensure that there was nothing left. It was a scorched earth policy. And that's a, a technical term. You can use that in an exam, scorched earth, to leave nothing for the enemy to use and to deprive their own citizens of what they needed. Adolf Hitler ordered that it take place behind where the German army were. So as the German army retreated, it would be a strategic desert. There'd be nothing to pick up. That would mean that ordinary civilians would endure, well, horrific loss and starvation because there'd be nothing to eat because the fields would be burned and salted. He literally ordered them to salt the fields so you couldn't grow things. To dynamite the train tracks and the roads, the houses, the buildings, the barns, the telegraph poles, anything to remove it all. Albert Speer stopped obeying those instructions in late 1944, but didn't tell Hitler till the last meeting. Again, if you want to watch Downfall, it's detailed there from Albert Speer's remembrances, though Albert Speer is an interesting character. He comes out of the war crimes trials at the end of the war at Nuremberg. If not, well, he looks like the more honorable Nazi. He says things like, I didn't know that we use slave labor. I should have known. I could have known. I could have found out at any point. I should have found out at any point, but I didn't. And people, yeah, that probably sounds about right. He's an interesting character. Make of that what you will. But he does stop obeying these orders, at least according to Albert Speer. The point I'm making, and the reason I bring it up, is to point out that the Nazi war machine and the Nazi state burns itself, destroys itself. The end result of Nazi ideology is spite and nothing more. That's what it is. Uh, Michael Rosen once said that uh, Nazism doesn't arrive, fascism doesn't arrive, um, telling you about death camps, goose stepping your way to victory, uh, loss, spite, destruction and death. It arrives as your friend. It promises the return of your respect and the return of your pride. It promises jobs. It promises food. It promises good things. It will take you to the pub. It will encourage you. It will be nice to you. It will listen in your darkest hours. And then it will end with spite because it's built on hatred. It's built on blaming others. That's what fascism actually is. Fascism lives in the world today. Fascism is all around us. And it's growing in strength and power. We see it in many countries. I shan't name them. You are perfectly capable of looking for yourselves. And you are perfectly capable of identifying it. And you're the youth. Bear in mind that in Nazi Germany, the youth in the war were the first to realize something was amiss. That doesn't make them a huge opposition movement. We've been through the youth. I explained the opposition movements weren't that great. But people like the White Rose Movement, they're only around about six of them, they twigged and they were acting as much as they thought they could. You've got the um, Edelweiss Pirates, somewhere around 18 of them were murdered in 1944 uh, at a public hanging. What was their crime? They went on a walk and they beat up some Hitler Youth members. That is bad, you shouldn't beat people up. But really? Execution? So the youth kind of realised, and the real reason for that is all the good leaders, the people who are actually good at looking after the youth, they go to war. They turn out to be really good at fighting um, and looking after soldiers, funnily enough. Uh, and they die in the war because there's so many millions. So Germany in the last months, pretty dire is my point. All of which brings me to the end of chapter three, four, chapter four, the third part of chapter four. Now, this is a much shorter video you might have noticed but the idea behind that is you use the extra time here uh, as I said at the beginning uh, to finish off that storyboard uh, that will be in the description on the show my homework I'm hoping that this has been interesting I'm hoping 
do you understand the relevance of the quote that I do have on the wall from Anais Nin? And I'm hoping that it makes sense now. When people talk about Britain's finest hour being in the Second World War, I'm hoping you realise what that actually refers to. And I'm hoping you realise that there's more to our national story than the Second World War. I am no nationalist. I am not a patriot. I hope you've spotted that. Um, but that doesn't mean that as an historian, I can't look back and say our greatest achievement in war was not losing the Second World War. It's not the most recent conflict. It's not the last conflict. And in terms of suffering, Britain is spared what happens in Europe, certainly in Germany. It is far worse for Germans than it is for British people. Britain's never really faced up to the Second World War and never really faced up to what that means for our national story. Be wary of those who say that it's the source of our pride and that it's somehow a, a better past that we can return to. Be wary of those who use it as a justification for things. Because as an historian, and you as an history student, we know there's, there's a lot more to history. I hope you've enjoyed this series of videos. That is the end of chapter four. Chapter five remains. We've got three weeks before the end of term. Uh, this is the third week, so I guess we've got six, seven lessons. We should just finish, and I do mean just. I mean that when we come back in September, it will be expected that you'll have got the course, the notes. Obviously, we'll do some practice um, when you get back. However, we do that when we return. Um, and these videos will still be here. I'm not going to delete them when we're done. So do return to them when you need to, when you need to revise. Um, and I apologise, if you're watching this for the second time, then maybe you should stop now, um, because I've babbled enough. Speaking of which, this is the end of the video. Have a lovely day, Year 10. I hope you're enjoying whatever it is you're up to, and I hope this hasn't wasted too much of your time. Uh, I will see you around. Um, and yeah, uh, it seems inappropriate to end on a joke, so I shan't.